So watch the clock times very closely because when world champion Magnus Carlsen was running seriously late for his round one blitz game in the world championships, his opponent Vladislav Kovalev went and did this. And stick around to the end because I'm going to go a bit deeper on why he played like this and why Magnus was running so badly late. So Magnus with black, after e4 he went pawn to e6, the French defence. White now took the center, black struck back, and now we saw the exchange variation, not necessarily the most testing line, and after recaptures played, the knight develops and Magnus comes with the bishop. Now we see the pawn come forward, challenging the center. Magnus develops his knight, defends that pawn, knight c3 attacks it again, and now Magnus castles, ignores the threat to that pawn, and here we see the pawn captured. Now watch this, two minutes two on the clock, Magnus only 35 seconds, bang. Here White used about, what, 40 seconds, 35, 40 seconds on that move, incredible, such a slow rate of play. Rookie eight check now played. Magnus doesn't recapture that pawn. He checks the king. The bishop blocks. And now Magnus develops his knight. He wants to bring it to this b6 square where he can then recapture this pawn comfortably. And after castles played here, he first takes the time out to nudge this pawn up, stop the bishop coming to g5. And now white goes wrong, a bit imprecise. The best move here is bishop c4. It defends this pawn, makes it harder for Magnus to recapture. And now if he carries on with knight to b6, the bishop drops back and he'll have to find a new plan, hold off recapturing that one to, uh, for now, maybe bring the bishop. Not easy when you're low on time. But here we see the rook coming to the e-file and now Magnus can comfortably recapture this pawn. So white throws the knight into e5, tries to mix things up tempting black to take here, then the pawn would recapture, but this isn't such a good version because although black can win a pawn back, this time you've given up one of your bishops and white has got the bishop pair, they've got the advantage. So after the knight jumped in, Magnus was undeterred, he takes this pawn. Now we see the bishop coming to f3, and again, look at the time on that, 60 seconds for white, bishop f3, 34 seconds. They're almost completely neck and neck now. And we see c6 supporting this knight. And after queen to b3, white is now down on time against Carlsen. So queen b6 challenges that queen. And now low on time, we see white actually restoring the same pawn structure, but giving Magnus the bishop pair. So pawn structure identical, but now shattered on b6. So yes, white has the better pawns, but the bishops for Magnus, they are better than that. They compensate. Black is now a bit better than white. So bishop d2 played, connects those rooks. Pawn f6 kicked the knight. It drops back into d3. And now we see a rook exchange. You don't recapture with the rook, or then you drop this pawn. So the bishop takes back. And now rook a4 from Magnus hits that pawn. It was defended with the bishop. And now this one developed. Hits the knight on d3. So that one now saved itself. King f7 played. Always activate your king in an end game. And now a3 protects that pawn, prepares to activate this rook. b5 from Magnus. He wants to liquidate this doubled pawn. The rook comes to c1. And now Magnus nudges his rook over here, so he challenges this c-file, creates a pin on this bishop, and that's why the rook now slides away, preparing to meet this move of pawn to b4, which was now played. The bishop recaptures, bishop takes, rook takes, and now two pawns attacked, the rook defended them, but look at the difference between these two rooks now. Magnus's one is very active, hitting two pawns. This one's very passive, defending two pawns. Plus the bishop is better than the knight, and the king is slightly more active than its counterpart. So Magnus is better. Low time on the clock as well. G5 played, gaining the king side space. Pawn to f3, and now we see that white wants to go g3, but doesn't want to be hit with g4. H5 now played, king f2, h4, and now this g3 move comes. And after this liquidation, pawn recaptures, Magnus activates the king, and the nice thing about this play for white is that now the knight finds a home on g2 and can come to e3, a much more active square than if it was sat on f3, just staring at its own pawn, staring at the black pawns. So king d6 played. 
Now the knight comes to e3. The bishop drops back. And now king e2, we see white's intentions here. They start shuffling, looking for a draw. Magnus goes rook b3. King f2 played. Rook b4 back. Gains some time for both players. King e2. And now rook a4. Magnus activates. He wants to try and pawn hunt. Get him round the back if he possibly can. King f2. Now bishop d7. That bishop's rerouting. Coming to this b5 diagonal. g4 played. And now rook a1 invades. Rook d1 challenges. And so Magnus drops back. The pawn is defended. Now b5, he starts the classic Magnus squeeze. And now king to e2 played, but this time the king is shuffling over. So after b4, creating a square for the bishop, we see king d3, bishop check, and now king c2. And it's a great plan because the king now holds the pawn, frees up the rook for activation. But after bishop c4 here, white just misses a trick. Now you definitely don't want to capture that bishop. After pawn recaptures, you've now freed up those pawns for action. They're connected, they could be dangerous. And the arrows I was just drawing there, if white ever pushes this pawn, well, it could become weak from this rook attack. So don't take that bishop, but what would be best was something like rook d1. It stops Magnus from invading on a1, and if he drops back to a8, preparing to go rook e8, attack this knight, well, you can ignore it, activate your own rook, and if Magnus attacks the knight, just defend with the king. White's absolutely fine, and black has to be a bit careful with the knight coming to f5 with check, the rook invading here or here. I mean, it's level, but okay, white should be absolutely fine. But we didn't see rook d1, we saw king b1, but now when Magnus retreats the rook, we see the king coming back and Magnus hits the knight. And this time it's not so comfortable to defend. You can't step with the king to d2, you can't defend with the rook. So the best here is actually knight f5 check, king goes, then just wait with your rook. Again, white should be okay. It was the way to go, but it's a bit less comfortable now. But what we see here is the cardinal sin mentioned earlier, knight takes on c4, pawn recaptures. These are monstrous pawns. Now probably what white was counting on was kicking this one as a passed pawn, getting it down the board for counterplay. But there's a miscalculation made. Now the best here is actually starting with this check. Really sneaky idea, because if the king comes up the board, attacks this one, looks so natural, you can actually defend with the king and create an awesome mating net. Because if white kicks on with the pawn, looks so natural to push through, well then you check and the king has zero squares, you have to give up the rook and then you get checkmated. So after this move of king c5, you wouldn't be able to push the pawn. You'd have to wait with the rook, say rook f2, and then black can simply collect the pawn, winning endgame. So b3 check was best, but Magnus invades with the rook. Seconds on the clock, still a good move. But in this variation, white gets rook d4. They exchange these pawns, so first the check, king goes, then they exchange these pawns here, not as deadly, but still tough for white because now black collects a second pawn. Magnus is now a pawn up with a dominant king and rook. Now the rook comes here, pressures this one. We see the king harass the rook, and now it comes across to this A file, so it keeps the king cut, also protects this pawn, but brilliant move from Magnus. He knows his king and pawn end games. He blocks the rook's defense. And if you capture, this pawn end game is simply lost. The extra pawn ahead, the king's come, gonna come over, the white king can't get close in one move. So we didn't see the rook take, it slid back here. But now Magnus comes with the king. He wants to box this one in, deliver a check, drive the king back. So the king was checked, such a natural move. Best, by the way, was just waiting with the king, say king e2 was top move. But after this check, king steps back, also holds this pawn, it's game over because the rook goes. Carlson collects here, white collects here, but you've got the two on one race now, and the two pawns versus one is always gonna win. In this position, we saw a resignation. Now, why the resigns? Well, this is an example of how the race could go. So say white pushes the pawn and black does the same. Well, when you get to here, the pawn's about to promote, the rook has to come, then you start running the second, and in this position, white has nothing. I mean, you can move the king, but then f2 comes. You could promote the pawn, but then we take. What does the rook do? If it captures here, we make the queen. If it captures here, obviously we recapture with the pawn. Whoops, like that. It's just game over. 
So why did Kovalev take so long to play his moves? Well, in short, the answer seems to be sportsmanship. So he didn't actually want to start the clock at the start of the round, but the arbiter made him do so because Magnus was running so late. And then when the game actually started, he took ages on the moves, of course, just to help Magnus catch up. So great sportsmanship from him. And why was Magnus actually late? Well, apparently he got stuck in traffic. It's as simple as that. And before you go, in case you missed my last video and you want to improve your chest dramatically in 2023, then I honestly cannot recommend enough the Aim Chest tool. So I recently started using this and what I love about it is it drags in your own game data from Lee Chess, Chess.com, Chess24, wherever you play. It then analyzes it, produces a dashboard and then gives you a personalized training plan showing you how to improve on your weakest areas so you can make the fastest gains at the fastest rate. Now they are sponsoring this video but I genuinely do love this tool, can't recommend it enough. So use code EPIC at checkout if you want to get this one and you get 30% off your first month and consider signing up to the annual that's the real best package because then you get the best value and you can use it through the year. Watch your rating skyrocket. Thanks very much for watching this one as always and I'll be back soon. Cheers.